Welcome to our final webinar in this series. My name is Leanne Hackman Carty with Economic Developers of Alberta. We have been doing this last series of webinars over the past two months in conjunction with AUMA, so the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association. So I want to thank them for their support. And uh, as, as for those of you who have been on the webinars before, you know that we tape these webinars so we can share them with our members who can't attend. Uh, we also, if you can keep yourself on mute when the speakers are speaking, that would be great. Uh, we haven't had any issues today, so that's great, but you know, just thought I'd let you know up front. Um, there will be questions and answers at the end. Usually we have a few minutes at the end. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat bar. And Nancy Toombs, my colleague, will be curating those and bringing those up at the end of the webinar. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Councillor Tanya Thorne. She's a councillor for the city of, or the town of Okotoks. And uh, she's going to be commenting on behalf of AUMA and introducing our speakers today. So, Councillor Thorne. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, and welcome everybody to today's session. As Leanne said, I'm Tanya Thorne. I am a councillor with the town of Okotoks and I'm also the vice president of towns on the AUMA Alberta Urban Municipalities um, Executive. So AMA is proud to sponsor the webinar series with the Economic Developers Association. Local economic development is a you know, key priority for our members. I'm especially interested in today's uh, topic, Alberta's Natural Resources Future, um, given my role on the Alberta Water Council, um, representing AMA there. Um, Alberta Water Council is a nonprofit multi-stakeholder partnership with members from government, um, non industry and non government organizations. And one of our primary tasks is to monitor and steward implementation of three key outcomes for the Alberta um, Water for Life strategy. One of which is to promote reliable quality water supplies for a sustainable economy. So the speakers today all sit, uh, have representation on that board. So it's great to see uh, all of that coming together. And I look forward to hearing their comments today. I would like to take note that all of us are experiencing, especially in the natural resource companies, um, currently going through changes with both with COVID and just the economy in general, and how the demand for our resource is changing, um, not only here locally, but worldwide. Um, we're seeing a decrease, obviously, in demand for oil and coal, and we're see seeing significant increase in demand on water. And these trends may persist for the foreseeable future. So I'm interested in seeing how companies are adapting and industries are adapting to those changing environments. So with that said, um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. At least I think it's the first speaker. I, I'll introduce them. I'm not exactly sure which order Leanne's got them speaking in. So if I'm out of order, then we'll go from there. So from the forestry um, industry, we have brought Brock Mulligan. Um, he's the Director of Communication with Alberta Forest Products Association, so welcome Brock. And then from the energy sector, we have uh, Ben Bruin, he's the VP of Oil Sands um, for CAP. And then from mining, we have Alistair Gibbons, who's the Executive Vice President for Riverdale uh, Resources. And then water, which is a passion of mine, so I'm looking forward to hearing from Kim Sturgis who's the CEO and founder of Water Smart um, Group of Companies. So welcome everybody, and I will turn it back to Leanne to get us started. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya, for your words, and I'm looking forward to getting started as well. I think we'll start with Ben Brennan uh, with CAP, so the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers. Um, uh, CAP has been actually a long-term supporter of EDA, of our conference, and so uh, we really appreciate your partnership. So, Ben, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Leanne, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I uh, certainly appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak to you all today. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, interesting times for our industry, and actually probably uh, one of the more difficult topics to be uh, addressing um, you know, sitting where we're at in the midst of COVID. Um, but I will, uh, I will share some perspectives, uh, particularly based on some of the questions that were sort of put forward to us uh, to think about um, in terms of positioning our, our messages. So, um, 
you know, it, it, some context for you from an oil and gas perspective. Um, COVID has been particularly uh, difficult for us, and I know it's sort of had some substantive impacts economy-wide. Uh, but for our industry, we have seen a reduction uh, in capital spending uh, basically since uh, since COVID uh, started of around $8.6 billion. So our industry as a whole across the country, it's approximately 32% decline. Uh, and so uh, with that has been a decline of uh, approximately 800,000 barrels per day uh, off of what was our production uh, you know, last year. Um, and then also, uh, if we were to sort of add uh, the turnarounds that some of the oil sands producers are uh, undertaking to coincide with this timing, that total actually gets up to about 1.2 uh, million barrels. So um, certainly a difficult spot for us. Uh, our expectation is we will not see uh, production return to the levels that it was pre-COVID until probably sometime mid-2021. Uh, so we've got ourselves uh, a ways before we can sort of get ourselves back to um, uh, what would you, what we would consider business as usual. Uh, and then it, beyond that, the question becomes, what does growth look like or the future for our industry? Uh, so that's, that's some of the context that uh, sort of maybe sets this up a little bit. Um, the good news is um, we do have um, a pretty strong presence across communities, uh, many communities across the province, and uh, I'm sure um, people on this call would be familiar with some of our supply chain work. Uh, and so, um, you know, we continue to have, um, you know, our latest numbers are, uh, are uh, you know, approximately, uh, uh, you know, over seven, 7,600 suppliers in the province representing, you know, 24 billion of, of goods and services pro procured. So there is sort of an existing um, integrated supply chain uh, system that has the potential to sort of help support our recovery uh, if we can position it well. Um, in terms of thinking about uh, the opportunities for us, um, um, I would say, uh, I, and I don't think this would be a surprise, um, there's a couple of spots. Uh, so natural gas has, you know, traditionally been, you know, quite difficult um, from an economic perspective. Uh, interestingly, with the decline in production in the United States, we've seen natural gas prices, um, you know, come up a little bit as a result of the associated gas um is sort of from the u.s not being produced and so that's actually you know it's got a forward uh view of it of um you know up from say one and a half um uh to about three dollars um which uh actually has some optimism there from a gas perspective uh but of course the um uh, the dry gas has traditionally been in the mature areas, and um, we won't necessarily see a resurgence there. What we do potentially see is, you know, some of the drier gas um, areas in the northwest area of the province potentially uh, uh, being a little bit more favorable. Um, in the uh, the future for the provinces, in a conventional side of things, is largely going to be in in the northwest area, uh, the Montney type of area. Um, and when we see um, you know some uptick in, in the prices, both for oil and for gas, um, and as we see some of the oil sands production perhaps coming back on stream, you know it's going to take its time. But as it comes back on, that demand for condensate will also come back. So those elements. Uh, you know, suggest that there will be some activity returning to those traditional areas in Alberta. Uh, from our perspective, I think, um, you know, it's not particularly easy because there is going to need to be um, some restructuring, we think, um, within the sector. I mean, naturally, there's probably still going to be some consolidation once companies see um, a bit of line of sight to the recovery. There's still some uncertainty with respect to uh, whether we'd see a second wave of COVID and what that looks like. And as a result, there's just reluctance and, and hesitancy 
for companies to think about their future plans. And that in combination with the difficulty they have from a cash flow perspective simply means we're still in the holding pattern. Uh, but as we look to emerge, we expect we will see some consolidation of companies. And I think we'll also need to be seeing some consolidation in the supply chain. Uh, and so, you know, from an opportunities perspective, I would look to those traditional supply chain hubs, uh, whether they're uh, Grand Prairie or Red Deer or Edmonton, Duke, um, or um, even, you know, Wood Buffalo and Calgary. Uh, to what extent, um, you know, can we be trying to, um, thinking about strengthening that supply chain, consolidating, taking advantage of economies of scale and scope? Uh, to try to sort of um, position us as a competitive and resilient um, industry. And so that's the type of thing that will probably, I would encourage, or, or at least some some thoughtful um, uh, strategic um, positioning would, would be probably wise. And then, um, uh, you know, so that's from an industry perspective. Uh, structure perspective, but from a from a municipal structure perspective, unfortunately, we do have um, I'd say some structural disconnects between um, where we're at from a municipal sort of assessment and tax perspective, and where we need to be to sort of get back to competitiveness. Uh, and so, to the extent that we could be looking at ways to sort of alleviate those cost burdens, particularly on the mature assets in southeast Alberta, that's a is sort of a, a real a real dark spot that's going to need some reconciliation before we can sort of see a return to job creation there um, and and that's just something that we know the province is looking at but is it still needs to be resolved and so it's sort of a message to you know municipal uh, leaders or economic development uh, agencies would be to what extent can we find ways to reduce that cost burden in those jurisdictions locally um, so that we can get companies comfortable maintaining operations and jobs and potentially sort of finding ways to um, get more value out of additional mature assets. A fair amount of consolidation and or um, uh, abandonment could be occurring in that area and, um, with this environment. And then sort of looking to the future uh, a little bit further down, um, you know, some of the bright spots include things like TMX pipeline being built, uh, you know, 2022 uh, timeline there. Uh, we've been looking at Enbridge Line 3. That unfortunately continues to be delayed. <laughs> if you look a year ago, it would have had an in-service date of, you know, Q4 2020. But it, as we see it now, it's that in-service date's probably been bumped up to mid to second half of 2021. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Alberta government's investment in uh, in Keystone uh, with a much longer in-service date, I think around 2024, perhaps. So, um, But those are future opportunities. So, you know, we will get out of COVID. We are seeing some of, um, you know, the demand numbers indicate that um, global energy will recover. Um, but we do need to think about structurally as an industry, you know, how do we need to to sort of position ourselves to be able to compete in a post-COVID environment. The reality is every single jurisdiction is going to compete competing very hard for capital and, and Alberta is going to be no different. And so, you know, that lens will be important, but then medium term, if we see these pipes come on stream, I think the opportunity set is what are those support areas that sort of traditionally would, would service um, sort of those new pipelines and, uh, the corresponding demands there, that's that's pretty key. And then secondly, I would say clean tech, uh, emissions reducing technology continues to be a priority and theme, both for the provincial government and the federal government and for industry as well. And I know that companies will continue to be in sort of investing in sort of technology, emissions reducing technology, notably, but methane reducing, ways that they can reduce their operating costs, those types of things. So any business development that encourages that type of investment, um, I think is going to be you know, pay some dividends down the road. So those are my comments. Hopefully uh, uh, that's enough to sort of start a bit of a discussion on some Q&A. So uh, maybe I'll stop there and turn it back to, uh, to you, Leanne, for, uh, to carry us through the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, Ben. I appreciate those comments. Uh, next, we'll go to uh, Alistair Gibbons out of Riversdale 
resources. Uh, Alistair uh, was pointed out to me, one of our members, Natalie Gibbs, and I think Natalie's on the call, has been uh, getting to know Alistair down in Crow's Nest Pass area and some of the work they're doing. So Alistair, if you could uh, go next and explain about some of the, the work you're doing in Crow's Nest Past in the mining industry. Thanks very much, Leanne. What I'll do is I'll actually share, I've got a bit of a presentation, I'll, I'll just share that quickly and, uh, and we can run through that. Um, let's just make sure that we get on from the beginning. Right, um, can, you, can you all see that? Yeah, we can. Okay, all right. So uh, Riversdale Resources is actually in a, in a slightly different position from a COVID point of view and uh, we've been in the fortunate uh, fortunate position to actually continue hiring right the way through the COVID period. And I'll give you a little bit of a background as I go through the presentation and, uh, you know, how, how excited we are with, with this project. Um, so fundamentally, Riversdale Resources was bought by Hancock Investment or Hancock uh, Prospecting, which is a large private uh, in, um, company based out in uh, Perth in, in Australia. So they bought, uh, they bought Riversdale Resources from the previous owners for 750 million uh, Australian. And um, we have a project that we're busy working through, and we'll, I'll take you through that, um, that has a probably an expected project cost in the vicinity of about another $750 million. Um, the rationale on why Hancock were looking at um, coming, into, um, coming into the metallurgical coal um, they have existing iron ore operations in, in Australia and obviously um, obviously the metallurgical coal is a, is a key component to steel making with iron ore. So it was very much a hand in glove relationship. Um, Grassy Mountain is a high quality coking coal, very close to uh, um, the border with BC and, uh, and uh, very similar to the tech coals. Um, Canada is seen as a tier one investment destination and, uh, and, a, and, a, and has highly skilled workforces as well as um, it is a diversified company and fits very much the Australian and the Canadian um, aspect. Uh, Hancock have got large tracts of, uh, of agricultural ground. Um, they own about um, the same amount of ground as Ireland in, in, uh, in size and have a large, the largest uh, holder of um, Wagyu and uh, cattle uh, in, in Australia. Uh, and obviously, you know, Alberta, that, uh, that is, is very, sounds very uh, sort of uh, runs strong parallels. And then obviously from a mining point of view, as I said, the hand in glove. Um, you know, the previous speaker, Ben, was talking around uh, capital constraints and things and challenges along those lines. And uh, one of, the, one of the benefits that we do have from Hancock is they have an exceptionally strong balance sheet uh, and this would be paid out uh, through their balance sheet and wouldn't need to be going out to bank banks or anything along those lines. So fundamentally from a, an ability to fund the project, they will fund it internally, um, which, is, uh, which is unusual in the resources industry as it stands at the moment. Um, the other area that we believe that fits very strongly in with um, well, this project with uh, the Canadian uh, federal government plans is that recently they've uh, established the Canadian Minerals and Metals Plan, which has six elements to it. And uh, Fundamentally, when you go through each of those elements, we do believe that we have the ticks in the boxes. Um, you know, a large challenge, and I'll go through the First Nations, is the support by First Nations, and uh, certainly we do, we do have that as well. But again, economic development and competitiveness, it is around making Canada competitive economic, uh, from an economic point of view. Um, there are challenges around this, and um, you know, there's a lot of work that's being done on this at the moment, but certainly there are challenges around that aspect. Um, participation of indigenous, uh, um, indigenous peoples, um, as I say, I'll go a little bit later into the, into the, uh, in the presentation around that. Environment, very focused on the environment and uh, that links into science, technology and innovation. A lot of the stuff that we will be bringing in um, hasn't been used in Canada before or is only just starting to be used. So there's a lot of it coming through from new technology in Australia and stuff like that. From a community point of view, uh, you know, as, as Natalie would know, um, 
southwest Alberta and specifically the Crow's Nest Pass uh, is a is is a um, a very poor area um, from a um, just purely from a demographic as well as uh, as well as an economic point of view, and uh, the ability to actually bring um, the, you know bring funds and uh, investments into that area is key, and then from a global point of view, the ability to actually start again um, bringing Canada to sort of the fore as far as um, re um, representation within Australia and Canada as well and there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of other mining companies that are looking at Canada um, but there are also a lot of mining companies that are looking at the permitting process as well and the challenges around that just for those um, that you know may not understand the differences between steel making coal and thermal coal. Thermal coal is used to burn for power. Steel making coal is obviously used to produce steel and generate steel, fundamentally two very different products. And this here just gives you an indication of where and what um, and how the steel market's gone. Since 2000, as I said, it's, uh, it's nearly doubled. Um, the steel is 100% recyclable and uh, a lot of that is uh, buildings are taken down and then the steel used again. And then I think also in the bottom, just to understand how much, um, how much coal it actually takes to, to build a wind turbine and things along those lines. So anything from wind turbine, cars, refrigerators, all require, uh, all require um, steel making coal to, uh, to produce. I think the one that interests me is, is the one in the, the middle left there, which 1.63 billion tons of steel was produced. Uh, this was in 20, uh, this was in 2005, and 1.26 billion tons uh, of steel making coal was produced in order to do that. So uh, there's certainly a lot of a lot of coal that goes into that, and currently there's no. Uh, there's no substitute uh, in order to do that. Uh, they are looking at hydrogen and that, but that is probably years away. Um, just some stats on, on grassy and, and how and what we see. The photographs on the left-hand side, you can see that this is, a, is an old mine. It was stopped in 1959. Um, so not only are we mining that area, it's also a rehabilitation project as well. Um, so, you know, the advantages of actually getting into there and rehabilitating the area at the same time. Uh, it's got about a 23 year life and the amount of jobs that will create during construction is about 7,000. And then about between, on average, about 400 jobs um, on, a, on a permanent basis running through for 23 years. So certainly in an area that is very depressed and, uh, and doesn't have a huge amount of uh, economic growth, it's, uh, it, it's exciting for, for most people down here. Um, as I said, First, First Nation and community support, um, which is absolutely key. Um, we're in the Treaty 7, uh, Treaty 7 area. We have IBA signed with all of the, uh, all of the Treaty 7 nations. Um, we have letters of support and um, from Métis as well as uh, all Treaty 7 and are currently having discussions with Tanaka and BC. Um, in general, the, the, uh, the communities uh, and adjacent municipalities uh, strongly support the project um, for obvious reasons. Uh, Crow's Nest Pass itself, uh, the tax revenue side or, or the revenue generated is about 89% from, um, from residential and very little from uh, uh, from industry. So the challenges around that. Um, as always, uh, you know, this is not clear, uh, or not easy sailing and things along those lines. Sorry, excuse me. Um, you know, there are some. Right, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, there are there are some comp or there are some municipalities or a municipality specifically that doesn't uh, that doesn't uh, want the development and that is predominantly um, there are um, there are ranches and don't want uh, anything to change. Um, where we are in the permitting process, um, we are about to go into a panel hearing. We're hoping that will be September October. Um, then the panel hearing is about three months um, for. A, um, a general hearing a report to be generated and then it goes into the federal system for um, about five months. So the expectation is assuming everything goes fine and about uh, 
quarter one next year, we should have the permit and then we can start producing uh, or start constructing. Um, logistics, uh, very close to a railway line and everything along those lines. So we have about a three kilometer spur that we need to put in. Uh, and uh, then we get on to the Canadian Pacific, uh, Pacific line that we have. So I'll, I'll stop sharing and uh, just carry on. But fundamentally, you know, when you're talking around COVID, as I said, um, the advantages that we have is that we have a very strong backer and that we've been able to run through COVID and increase numbers. Um, from a project point of view, it is in an area that is extremely, as I say, uh, economically depressed and the ability to bring in uh, one construction and then um, and then an ongoing workforce and then the ripple effect of that. Generally, it's in a ratio of about one to four. So, you know, you could be up to sort of 1,200 people being impacted, impacted by the, the new mine coming in uh, into play. Um, and then, as I say, fundamentally from a economic point of view and, uh, and a benefit from, uh, or sorry, and a funding point of view, uh, with Hancock behind us and uh, very, very strong and deep pockets, um, you know, the funding will be internal and uh, not need to go out to uh, to other sources, which, you know, is, is a challenge now, um, generally for the resources. So, and hopefully that just will give a very, very quick overview of, uh, of Riversdale and that. And, uh, you know, we are certainly excited with this project and um, are looking forward to kicking it off and obviously the impacts that, uh, you know, that we can bring to the, that we can bring to the region. That's great. Thanks. I don't know, for, for those of you who've lived in Alberta a long time, you remember the days when we always had projects going on. Here's another announcement. Here's another announcement. And so I got to say, this is, this is wonderful to hear something positive going on, something, a big project that's going to bring a lot of hope and a lot of jobs to an area of our, our province. And hopefully there will be more in the future. So thank you very much uh, for, for your belief in Alberta. Uh, Alistair. So uh, next, I think we're going to go to Kim Sturgis. Kim is uh, with the WaterSmart group of companies, and I think well known to many of you. So Kim, if you want to go ahead. Great. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate the opportunity uh, today. I also have a, a deck, so let me uh, um, pull that up. And uh, hopefully there. There. Can you see? Yeah. Great. So I'm just going to run through these quite quickly and just give you, uh, I, I personally believe that water is Alberta's economic advantage and uh, that's the, the point that I'm hoping I'll make today. So just quickly, water is very different from other resources. It's very emotional. It's very, very personal. And, you know, when it, when it, it, uh, it hurts you, like when it hurt, it hurts you very personally when it hurts you. And, and we've just had the seventh anniversary of the Calgary flood and, and so I think many of us um, appreciate uh, what that meant. The other one is watershed impacts are extremely localized. Um, and there's also a debate on water as a human right. So, um, and uh, the other one, water is very fluid. So everything is actually connected. It's got a natural cycle. It crosses political boundaries. It doesn't respect uh, the political boundaries. And um, just very quickly, the groundwater also moves quite differently from, from surface water. We don't create or destroy water. It just moves from one form to another, either above the ground or, or, or below the ground. And the, and the really famous quote here, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. And uh, so uh, throughout here, I'll usually put a couple of personal vignettes. And this uh, picture here is on the mighty Athabasca River across from our uh, campsite. Uh, which is a beautiful place. Climate is water and water is climate. And this is extremely important. I think people are starting to understand this now that the, the strong link between climate change and water, it's, you know, it's contributed to the mitigation is about carbon, adaptation is about water. So you know, mitigation uh, is, a, is a global, it's a trigger and it takes time. Adaptation, it's, it's about water, it's local, it requires action and it's needed now which is very important. Um, we have a competitive advantage. Uh, and us water people would say like the, the advantage that Alberta has is we're upstream with the exception of, of uh, a piece of the uh, Peace River, um, you know, coming in, we're upstream. Uh, if, if, you, um, if you're considering doing a bunch of economic development based on water resources, 
uh, you'd rather be here than pretty well anywhere else in the in the uh, in the Saskatchewan River Basin, for sure. Um, this uh, shows the variability, uh, interannual flow variability, which means the ability with which you can depend on the amount of that you can depend on your water resources to be the same year after year. And and because of our up, upstream position with our snowpack and, and that, and that is changing, of course, with, with climate, uh, a changing climate as well. But we're sure in a better position. You do not want to be in the bright blue area would be the message of of uh, of this picture. Also, technology, I'm an engineer and I like to think technology can solve everything, but there really is no silver um, bullet. This is a systems problem, not a, not a technology solution uniquely. And scale is very critical. Like we think about water globally, we plan for it regionally, but we act locally. And uh, the picture on the right there is uh, just below the ridge where we live, where uh, the Colpitch Ranch was pretty well um, inundated uh, in 2013. So these actions all have to be taken locally. Um, water, global water resources are finite. Uh, and I won't go into all the numbers here, but the point of this is that by the time you actually go from all the water in the world, which is about 45,000 cubic kilometers, uh, on a yearly basis and actually work that through to water that we can actually use for purposes uh, of industry or of uh, agriculture or domestic use, it only comes down to about 11,500 cubic kilometers per year. And where that water goes is, is super uh, I I important. Um, the uh, uh, the um, uh, majority of the water here is used in agriculture. So it's either withdrawn and gone into agriculture or it's a uh, consumptive uh, use and where that water goes. And about 90% of the water in the world uh, actually is consumed in, in agriculture. And foods take different amount of water, different amounts of water to, to make. You know, so, you know, a cabbage takes very little water to make per kilogram of product whereas beef, and I have a lot of females working in my organization, chocolate, we have to put that in. Um, a lot of water is consumed to make either beef or chocolate. And as we get more, um, uh, our, uh, um, the, we get a bigger middle class, the global middle class projected is, is gonna be by 5 billion by 2030. They're eating a lot more meat and chocolate. And that means there's a lot more water that needs to be used for agriculture. And then, so really what happens is we, uh, around 2050 and 10 billion people, and in some regions now, that's when we hit the, the water scarcity. And it has a lot to do with, with the amount of water that we're consuming in food. So really toward 2050, the rising population, we're expected to about, need about 70% more food production. And the largest contribution to that is gonna come from the intensification of uh, production on existing agricultural land. And that has a big impl implication for Canada. Um, you know, Canada is uh, one of the biggest exporters of food in the world and we export water and food and that's a really important concept. Um, and, you know, but basically, you know, by 2050, Canada is going to be, and especially Western Canada is going to be one of the very few areas where crop yields can increase in the whole world, which means we're going to be called upon to meet that food demand. And that, that's a, a, a big economic driver. Um, we have water issues varying across Alberta. We've got agriculture in the south and kind of energy in the north. And you can see the uh, the big red um, circle there is the Palliser Triangle, and, and that's where a very large amount of, of food is produced. About 85% of the allocate of the water consumed in southern Alberta um, is, is uh, consumed for irrigation purposes, and 66% of the irrigated land in Canada is in that big red circle, which is interesting. Um, the allocations, the annual allocations have stayed pretty well the same over the last 10 years. Um, the allocation is about 10 million cubic meters. We tend to, we, about a third of that is what actually gets consumed. And you can see 67% of that is consumed in, uh, in, in agriculture uh, in the whole province. So, you know, that's, that's important, uh, that's important uh, uh, to know. The forestry part, which I think we're going to hear about next, is actually in that 14%. Um, 
And uh, Ben has talked about the 8% petroleum and Alistair talked about the industrial. So uh, that's where those fit in. Um, but the challenge is that agriculture is concentrated in the highest water stressed areas and that's the red. Uh, and so it's really important we can on the right side there, they've got water stressed areas across Alberta, but the biggest stresses are, are where we are right now. So that's really the issue is the water energy food nexus. And there's a really big trade off here in terms of, of how that, uh, how that works. So I'll look at the note, but I think that's uh, the end of uh, my slide. Thank you very much, Kim. And I will do my best when I'm editing this uh, webinar to match your slides with your talking. So I apologize that we didn't point that out earlier. But yeah, thank no. you very much. Appreciate that perspective. So finally, uh, we've got Brock Mulligan from the Alberta Forest Products Association. Uh, and he's going to speak to us about the forestry industry. So go ahead, Brock. Thanks so much for having me on, Leanne. Is everybody able to see my screen and hear me? Hey, let's give that a go. Working? Yeah. Got a winner and I'll start this from the beginning. All right, sweet. I think we're rocking. Uh, so thanks very much for having me on. Um, we say in our industry that communities are the most valuable advocates that we have and, and that's 100% true. Um, so it's a, a real pleasure to be speaking to folks in the economic development and municipal space. Um, just to give everybody kind of an idea of of how our industry has come through COVID. We did have a little bit of a blip in, in demand, especially on the lumber side, right at the beginning for about a month or so, um, with a lot of construction sites around North America shut down. Um, even still in Alberta, the vast majority of our mills were able to, to continue running and frankly, BC bore the brunt of it. They had about 70% of their production go down. Um, because things are just not quite as competitive there and they also don't necessarily have the supply of wood to go into the mills. Um, we're now back running 100% and, and really, um, frankly, ticking along quite nicely. Uh, so just to give folks a sense of, of where our industry kind of is, um, we have about 20,000 direct employees and then um, a, a kind of a two to one multiplier effect of people who depend on forestry for their jobs and things like environmental consulting, uh, sales of supplies, road building, that kind of stuff. Uh, $7 billion economic impact and we work in about 70 communities across the province. Now, I don't think that forestry is the biggest industry in, in many of the communities that we operate in at all. Um, many of those uh, communities have very large uh, energy components. They also have agriculture and mining. Um, but the thing is that it's been, I think, a little bit uh, beneficial in that um, over the past couple decades, both uh, energy industry and, and our industry have, ha have had our ups and downs. But fortunately, they've, they've kind of not come at the same time. So I know that when I joined uh, the forest industry in 2010, oil and gas was really booming and we were kind of mediocre. Um, the last few years, our industry has been quite strong. And, and I know that, I mean, it's obviously not, not going to mitigate all the impact of our biggest industry in the province going down. Um, but in communities where we operate, it's provided a real benefit. It's provided some real cushioning and, and a little bit of extra economic diversity. So that, that's kind of where we fit in, um, in forestry to, to sort of the broader economic development picture in the province. Just wanted to talk a little bit about where we're going and, and some of the future opportunities for our industry. So on the left is the, the Mjøstarnet Tower in Norway. It's now the, the world's tallest wood building, uh, 18 stories and 85 meters. Now, unfortunately, that building's not in Alberta, um, but I think that this is where we're starting to, to go um, as a society. Folks around the world are starting to see that there's a real benefit to putting more wood in their buildings. And, and of course, there's steel and concrete in these buildings as well. Um, but uh, they tend to be lighter. They tend to often, in, in places like Alberta, be able to be produced locally. They tend to have a really good environmental footprint. And they tend to be much quicker and easier to build, especially in cold climates, because you're you know, you're not having to shut down production when it gets cold because you can't pour concrete or, or things like that. 
So uh, this is a the, this building is the tallest right now, but there's already one under construction in Sweden that's going to be taller. Uh, we've changed the building codes in Alberta to allow wood buildings up to 12 stories tall, and I think that this is going to going to present a tremendous impact for our industry going forward. The the second thing that is on the pulp side, um, we've seen through COVID a, a lot more, uh, frankly, exposure for for products that pulp's made out of. When you're talking about things like N95 masks or surgical masks, laboratory filters, uh, filters that are in transportation equipment that's been so critical. People have, I, I think, known for you know, over a century that, that uh, forest products are, are, are really beneficial because they're so versatile and they're used in so many of these applications. But I think that we've seen through COVID, um, Pulp's kind of become a bit of a, a, a bit of a hero um, because so many of the materials that we need are are constructed from it. And, and here in Alberta, we're really well positioned to capitalize on some of the opportunities that that's going to present. We have the the newest and, and most efficient set of pulp mills in North America. Five of the five of our seven mills uh, were built in the '90s. Um, and even those that are a couple of, that are a little bit older uh, have had significant investment. So in terms of a competitive position, our, our mills are, are really strong. Um, and we think that this, this puts us in a, in a great spot to take advantage of some of the opportunities that are, are going to be coming down the road. And lastly, I just wanted to touch a little bit on our Love Alberta Forest campaign, which has been, uh, it's a three-year commitment that we've made. Um, and we have finished year one off and are, are kind of heading into year two now. And I'm hoping that some, some folks on the screen or, or some folks on the, on the conference have, have come across the campaign. And, and really where we were as an industry, we were seeing uh, folks from frankly lived in other places claiming to, to love our forests and, and effectively not wanting industrial development to happen. And I think that that's something that, that folks in other industries will be able to, to relate to. Um, I was on a call this morning with, with Natural Resources Defense Council, great lovers of our forests. Uh, they were calling from the, the wonderful boreal forest communities of Washington, DC and Santa Monica, California. And, and so these folks have, have kind of taken that space where they love our forests and, and put a certain bent on it. And, and we as an industry said, you know what, that, that's not right. People who love our forests are people who work in them every day, who put in 40 years slogging through the muskeg to make sure that they're sustainably managed. That's who loves our forests. We're taking the space back. Uh, and so as an industry, we've committed $2.1 million over three years to telling this story. The campaign had a large ad buy that, that ran in September last year, and it'll run again in September this year. Uh, TV, billboards, movie theaters, Tim Hortons TV, and a large digital presence. So that's what we're doing to kind of protect some of the economic opportunities that are there because our forests are managed better than anywhere else in the world. And, and um, that's a story that we need to tell in order to, to keep our economic progress going. And so that's all I have. I, I really thank you a lot for putting me on this panel. I think it's a tremendous opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Brock, uh, for giving us a little snapshot about Al Alberta's forests. And I, I love the, the logo, your campaign there. Uh, so I think we will um, go to Nancy, if you have seen any questions on the screen as we've gone. Yes, we have one question. Okay, so this is for Brock. And uh, Brock, can you also speak to the tremendous opportunities for cross laminated timber and what we need to do to encourage that? Yeah, so cross laminated timber is a really versatile building material because effectively what you're doing is taking um, dimensional lumber, like a two by four uh, from, a, from a primary sawmill, sending it to a secondary facility for value add. And, and then they can be made in virtually any dimension, very strong, very fire resistant um, and, and just a tremendous way to, to kind of build, to meet that demand for buildings that look great and also perform really well environmentally. Um, so we, we've seen some movement on building codes in Alberta, which, which previously was a huge uh, barrier. We couldn't build anything above four stories and then they moved up to six and now it's 12. 
huge barrier to that type of development. We've seen that change. Government of Alberta took what we think is a really good step. And, and now I think the next phase is we, is we really just need our economy to fire on all cylinders because right now folks are not necessarily in a mood to be investing a lot in a big building just because of the way the economy is. Uh, but when they are, we're going to be really well positioned to meet the opportunities. Great. Thank you. Are there any more questions or, or any comments from the panelists as, as uh, we progressed on the panel? Any other thoughts, comments that you might have thought of as they, the others presented? Oh, so very good. Very much. Well, the only thing I probably would say it's um, water and uh, is the limiting factor in terms of our development. Um, and there's going to be really Im important trade-offs uh, being made between energy production and forestry and mining and, and where Alistair is down in the south, uh, far southwest part of the province, that's a pretty water tight area. So there's some pretty, we're, we've been doing some work in that area on water supply. So I think that that may be it. And, and uh, Tanya, just to, yeah, and I, I was actually on the water council for many years myself. So uh, I think that's a, that's a really big issue um, in terms of economic recovery. We can't just put all the projects on the table and assume that they can all be done. Um, they can't violate the laws of physics and they can't violate the laws of the land. So um, I think that's uh, in Alberta an important uh, thing to remember as we start to reopen the economy and, and push hard on development. Yeah, Tanya, did you have any comments? Yeah, I, I think my, my question actually with, to all of them is, what do you see as the key role for municipalities to play in terms of resource development and policy around improving that, but at the same time looking at the synergies that Kim just talked about of how do we play the balance of not robbing from Peter to pay Paul kind of concept? Well, I'll have a cut at that. And I know on, on, from our industry's perspective, I think the, the greatest uh, strength of municipalities is the, is, the, is the advocacy side of things. I, th I think that all industries on this call, I'm, I'm sure that the, the energy uh, and coal folks face criticism about where your resource is coming from and the impact that its development has on the community. And, and having people who live in those communities stand up and say, well, you know what, that, that's frankly not right. We live here, we may, we're absolutely committed to doing it sustainably because it impacts us. Um, and we want this type of development in our communities is, is something that communities have done in the past and it's been extremely beneficial. And I think continuing to do that is um, something that we'd really greatly appreciate. There's a question here for Alistair. Um, Alistair, when do you think the public consultation is gonna start for the project? So from public consultation, we've actually gone right the way through that process. We've had two, uh, we have a JRP, uh, that's been it was established um, 2000 and uh, or are we now 18. Uh, we've had two rounds of public consultation. So the next uh, the next stage uh, or uh, um, the next stage is the JRP deeming the report as technically sufficient or the EIA is technically sufficient, which they basically have have said. So the next stage in our process is we actually go to a, a public hearing which is, you know, where, where you have interveners and, and those types of things. And then, as I said, roughly about eight months after that is when you, we would expect to have a permit. So there's a lot of work that's been done on this from a public consultation period already. Um, we're probably up to over 20,000 pages of documentation on the EIA. Uh, we've got 12 addendums. Uh, there's been a lot of work done um, with the Government of Canada and that as well. So that's, that's where we are at the moment. All right. Brock, there's another one for you. Sorry, uh, I was gonna, sorry Nancy, I was just going to ask, I was just going to have another quick uh, about the municipalities. Sure. Um, that's all right, very quickly. I think one of the challenges that, uh, that we have, um, certainly in the area, is are municipalities ready for development? So specifically, you know, Crow's Nest Pass and those areas, they are challenged around infrastructure, 
housing and things along those lines. And it's around how we actually work with the municipality to give them enough headspace or enough, uh, enough headroom in order to make sure that if the project does go ahead, that they have capacity of infrastructure and things along those lines as well. And depending obviously where you are, uh, you know, as I say, Crow's Nest Pass is, uh, is, a, is a challenge in this, but around how you get provincial and, you know, and the municipalities working together to make sure that the infrastructure is ready for economic development. All right. Well, I think we have time for one more question, and this is for Brock. Oh, uh, Kim, you had your hand up before I get yeah. to Brock? Yeah, there, well, there's actually a question that Cole sent to me privately, but I, if you don't mind, it would be good to answer it for everyone. <laughs> Sure. Um, which is, what can we do to move the needle on regulatory limitations in relation to water reuse in Alberta? Um, this file has been going, I've personally been involved in it since 2007. And it is um, a really hard one to keep moving. Uh, it involves five different government departments in the government of Alberta. I think it's been discussed at Water Council as well. Um, I think on the industrial side, we are all champing at the bit to get this done. There is a water reuse guideline, there's a, a draft policy, and it would be really great to get the industrial stuff out as quickly as possible. So people like um, Alistair can build his plant and reuse the water, and also municipalities can reuse water within there. I, 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 it's just not a high priority. Uh, for the policy folks in Alberta environment right now for a variety of reasons. And so, um, but we will continue to keep pushing on this um, very hard because I think it's an absolutely critical uh, piece that, that, uh, that needs to happen for municipalities as well as for industry. All right, thank you, Brock. Lastly, for you, speaking of files, please indicate the status of softwood, the softwood lumber dispute with the US and the effects on Alberta producers. Sure. So the software lumber dispute's been going on since, God, what game? It's been going on for like a hundred years, <laughs> but it's been back in court again since our, our last agreement uh, ended in about 2018. Um, so we've been working our way through NAFTA and WTO panels. The result of a, of a recent NAFTA panel ruling caused the U.S. to drop tariffs on Canadian lumber um, from 22 to about 8%, and that'll be taking effect in September. So that's really good news on our front. Um, we are also expecting a world a WTO ruling late in the summer or early fall. We're optimistic, but you never know. So I guess we'll see. Um, but uh, it, it's a fight from our from our view. Free trade is is absolutely 100% correct. And these are just unjustified actions by the US. We continue to win, but we have to fight through the process. So that's kind of where we're at. All right, thank you. And just as we wrap up, once again, thank you very much, Brock, Kim, Alistair, and Ben for presenting today, for helping us learn just a little bit more about the opportunities for Alberta's natural resource sectors. And uh, once again, Councillor Thorne, uh, and I see Maureen O'Neill is on the line uh, from AUMA. Just thanks very much for, for joining us in these, this webinar series to help bring attention to some of the opportunities that we will have going forward. As I mentioned earlier, this is our last uh, webinar in this series. We're taking, a, and I'm sure none of you will miss any Zoom calls. Um, we're all getting Zoomed out, so we're gonna take a little break. And uh, we will be back in uh, the fall. I don't know what we're going to look like in the fall, but we will be back and we'll let you know. But on behalf of EDA, thank you very much for taking the time today to, to join us and learn more. And uh, have a great summer. And hopefully we all come back COVID-free in the fall. So thanks again. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank Bye. you, everyone.